What I'm about to show you is a photo of billionaire heiress Anna de Rothschild posing with former President Donald Trump and South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham at President Trump's golf club in Miami, Trump International Golf Club. The day before, a Trump supporter had bought, brought Rothschild as a guest to Trump's other Miami club, Mar-a-Lago. She used her family name and her charm and the prospect of big potential business deals to not only get invited to that day of golfing, but to come back to Mar-a-Lago later that night, where she was invited to dine with Trump world luminaries, including Donald Trump Jr.'s fiance, Kimberly Guilfoyle. It's not exactly the most sensational situation you've ever heard of, right? There's just one problem. There is no Anna de Rothschild. The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project have done incredible investigative work tracking how this woman, a Ukrainian immigrant named Ina Yashchishin, allegedly pretended to be an heir to the famous Rothschild banking family in order to sneak her way into Trump's inner circle. This reporting has not been independently verified by NBC News, and the woman in question denies all of all of this. She claims she's being framed by a former business associate. But four guests who spoke with the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette say that Ms. Yashishin repeatedly told people at Mar-a-Lago that she was a Rothschild. And according to one of those guests, everyone was eating it up. Obviously, in light of the FBI investigation into the classified and top secret documents President Trump brought with him to Mar-a-Lago, the idea that anyone with a fake identity had access to this club is concerning. But I think it's really worth underlining just how nuts it is that this particular lie worked. I mean, there has been extensive reporting done on the Rothschild family and the heirs to that fortune. They're one of the most famous families in the world. They were the wealthiest family in the world for a large part of the 19th century. And they are the subject of more anti-Semitic conspiracy theories than maybe any other family in the world and have been for basically as long as they've been rich. There are literally conspiracy theorists who think it was the de Rothschilds, not the iceberg that sunk the Titanic. And those conspiracies are still alive and well. A few years back, Marjorie Taylor Greene implied that it was the Rothschild's Jewish space lasers. You remember that one? Jewish space lasers that had started one of California's deadliest wildfires. It actually was not. If this woman who lied her way into Mar-a-Lago had pretended to be a part of a fake dynasty, that would be one thing. I mean, okay, it would still be totally bonkers, but this is one of the most Googleable lies imaginable, and somehow it got past the Secret Service. What is even more concerning is that this woman just wasn't some random person using some thinly veiled lie. Both the Miami FBI field office and the Quebec Provincial Police in Canada were actively investigating her business dealings. A charity she led called United Hearts of Mercy was allegedly a fraud and possibly a money laundering operation. Not only did the payment processor for the charity determine that the hundreds of thousands of dollars flowing into that charity were generated from credit card numbers and bank accounts that had not been authorized for use by the owner's account, <laughs> but the, the charity's own accountant made a sworn statement to the FBI that the charity was actually a source of illicit funds for organized crime. After a charity drive organized by United Hearts of Mercy, that same accountant began to get calls from people who she suspected were from criminal groups, threatening violence and demanding money. The callers left voice messages from unknown numbers with accents, saying that if she did not return the money, she and her family would be harmed or killed. The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette adds that even though the charity was supposed to disclose its revenues to the public because of the amount of funds it took in, it failed to do so. So far, it's not clear where the funds went. So to sum it all up, an alleged fraudster, possibly with links to organized crime, somehow got past the Secret Service and into Mar-a-Lago, where President Trump had squirreled away top secret and classified documents in various unsecured areas. And it wasn't until March, nearly a year after their first encounter, that Trump's entourage discovered this woman's real identity. Everything is fine here, friends. I am sure that she was the only person to pull a trick like this and that no one got anywhere close to anything they shouldn't have. You seem pretty final in your judgment about what's going to happen here. I know you have a piece in the Daily Beast uh, today, the headline, it's over, Trump will be indicted. You seem quite certain there. Can you talk a little bit more about that? 
Sure. And I'll caveat that with it is very much my personal opinion and only my personal opinion, just based off my professional expertise and experience. It's nobody else's opinion. My view is that from the information we've seen, specifically what was made clear in the unsealed redacted part of this affidavit is that we know Trump had was had unauthorized retention and possession of national defense information. He was told not once but twice that he was not permitted to retain that at Mar-a-Lago. He continued to possess it despite efforts to recover it. And then finally, when he uh, when the FBI came out there in June, he, he and his lawyers swore there was no other information. He continued to actually have it despite that sworn affidavit. That is not only violation of the Espionage Act, that's Section 793E, but that is also potential obstruction provisions in terms of concealing that from the U.S. government. In my view, that is enough. That is sufficient to bring in indictment and certainly enough to get a conviction. Whether or not the government will take that path is ultimately it's in, in its discretion. I believe it can and should do so. Bradley Moss, National Security Attorney, really appreciate your time tonight. Thanks for joining me. Anytime, Alex. What shocks me in reading your timeline is not just the petulance of refusing to hand over the documents, but the brazenness of repeatedly lying to the National Archives and the Department of Justice. I mean, here in January, he's like, here's 15 boxes. That's all there is. They come back down in June, and he's like, also this, this, this mug. That's all that, that's it. We're done. And, and still, of course they come back, because it isn't all, but he's intent on subterfuge the entire yeah. time. Apparently, I mean, it's as if he doesn't truly understand the, the gravity of this, which leads me to ask you, a question you probably don't know the answer of, but could could he still have more down at Mar-a-Lago? Because it appears that the only, you know, the only things they know to look for are the things they saw on the surveillance tape from June. Right. They've gotten that stuff, we think, because they were uh, admitted entry into those storage rooms. But in theory, a person who's lied three times to the powers that be could be lying again. Sure. I mean, they did an extensive search, you know, multiple hours there. But could there be something hidden in some nook or cranny that they don't know about? You know, you raised earlier, could there be something at some other property? Given the way that Donald Trump handled classified documents, almost anything is possible. You know, obviously, he was known to, to rip them up. My colleague Maggie Haberman reported that he was uh, allegedly putting some in toilets or flushing them. Yes. So, you know, th the idea that, that this is all there is and they've recovered everything, I think, you know, is still an open question. After the FBI search of Mar-a-Lago, allies of Donald Trump insisted that the action itself was politically motivated. They claimed that if the feds really wanted those documents, all they had to do was ask. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy was so livid, he threatened to launch an investigation into the DOJ and Attorney General Merrick Garland, at one point arguing, why wouldn't they just ask the president if they had something there that they wanted? He surely would have provided it to them. Why did they have to show up in the manner that they did? Indeed. It turns out that the authorities did ask for access. And now even Fox News viewers are being educated on that specific point. Going back to the New York Post headline in the middle of all of this, you could have just asked. They were asking. How many times? We don't know. But the impression in, in, in the affidavit is that they asked for him multiple times. And President Trump has said several times all they had to do was ask. Well, my sense is they were asking for a year and a half. And why, why he was holding on to these materials when he had no legal authority to do so under the Presidential Records Act is beyond me. Again, that is Carl Rove saying the federal government did ask multiple times over a year and a half. So there goes that argument. A small group of fervent Trump supporters have moved on to a new talking point, claiming that there are simply too many redactions in the affidavit and that there is just no transparency. Look at all that black ink. The third-ranking Republican in the House, Elise Stefanik, told Fox News, quote, the American people deserve transparency and not an outrageously heavily redacted affidavit to cover up for and politically protect Joe Biden and the FBI for this dangerous and un-American overreach. Who is to say that if we were to learn what was in those redactions, that they'd necessarily be good for Donald Trump? I mean, that is perhaps why the reaction from the overwhelming majority of Republicans has simply been silence. 
As the New York Times notes, even the most bombastic Republicans, people like Representatives Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert, they were initially focused elsewhere in the hours after the affidavit was released. They were tweeting about things like border invasions. And as the Washington Post points out, even GOP leaders like Congressman Kevin McCarthy and Senator Mitch McConnell have gone mum. Neither man has responded to requests for comment tonight from the Washington Post. That does it for us tonight. Rachel will be here on Monday, and I will see you back here on Tuesday. Now it is time for the last word, for the last word. Allie Velvins tonight. Good evening, Allie. I have a big smile on my face because of what you just said. I'm thinking to myself, we're not going to, I, I, we can be waiting a long time before those people <laughs> respond and, and say something about that. It, it's kind of wild how everybody's gone suddenly silent on this thing. Uh, when this you've is, lost Carl Rove, you yes, know you're in you, trouble. You, you've lost the game. You still have the surveillance tape, is that correct? Will you, are you allowed to share that with the country? Absolutely, Sean, at the right time. After the FBI searched Mar-a-Lago, there was a drumbeat of conservative calls for releasing the tapes. What they meant by that was the surveillance footage of plainclothed FBI agents executing their search warrant at Mar-a-Lago on August 8th. We still do not have that footage. Trump and his people never did release it, at least not yet. There were reportedly concerns in Trump world that releasing that tape might show the sheer volume of materials that federal agents seized. But as of this afternoon, we do have the heavily redacted affidavit for the search warrant used to conduct that August 8th search. And on page two of the affidavit, you see this. The FBI laying out the reason they needed to check Mar-a-Lago after Trump turned over 15 boxes of documents in January. Quote, there is probable cause to believe that additional documents that contain classified national defense information remain at the premises. There is also probable cause to believe that evidence of obstruction will be found at the premises. Evidence of obstruction? What could that be? Well... Number one, on June 3rd, after a visit from federal prosecutors, Trump's lawyers Christina Bob and Evan Corcoran said, nothing to see here, folks. There is nothing to see here. Corcoran prepared a statement to the DOJ claiming that all the classified material had been returned, and Christina Bob signed it, according to the New York Times, which cited two people familiar with that meeting. And then here's number two. The DOJ, unconvinced by Trump's lawyers, subpoenaed Mar-a-Lago surveillance tapes in late June. Not the tape that Eric Trump was talking about. This was a surveillance tape from earlier, one that reportedly shows people moving boxes out of Mar-a-Lago and the storage room around the same time that the DOJ was asking if there were any more important documents down there at Mar-a-Lago. The tapes also reportedly show boxes being stuffed into different containers again around June 3rd, when Trump's lawyers were saying essentially, nothing doing, you have everything already. Of course, today we know that that is not true at all, and it matters. The Times reports, quote, that June 3rd statement, the one from the lawyers, that is, along with visuals from the surveillance camera footage of the property and witness interviews were said to be part of the concerns among investigators about obstruction. Joining us now is Barbara McQuaid, former United States attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan. Barb, thanks so much for joining us. I'm oh, glad to be with you, Alex. So let's talk about these sort of two elements as it pertains to obstruction. The first is the surveillance footage. How meaningful is that in the potential charge of obstruction? This, this notion that there were people moving material around Mar-a-Lago around the same time that the government was asking, hey, do we have everything down there? Yeah, you know, what's interesting about the charge that is identified in the search warrant affidavit, it is, it's a particular type of obstruction of justice. It's 18 U.S.C. Section 1519, which specifically refers to concealing of documents. It's not like witness tampering or some of the other kinds of obstruction statutes. It's specifically concealing of documents. And so, uh, as you just described, moving around some of these documents during a time when there has been a great deal of back and forth about what they have and what they don't have and what they need to return does suggest that there could be a suspicion or even probable cause that they are concealing some of the documents that the archives wants back. It's worth noting that the DOJ is seeking the Mar-a-Lago footage again. This time, the footage, I believe it's either after the raid, but it's 
after that sort of initial tranche of surveillance footage from June 22nd, right? There's like a period of several weeks before the FBI searches Mar-a-Lago. And I believe the DOJ is looking for surveillance footage of that period, mostly the month of July. What does that tell you? Well, it does suggest they, they had to have some reason to know that there was something amiss that they wanted to see might have been revealed on that surveillance video. So what it says to me is perhaps there is a witness within Mar-a-Lago, one or more witnesses, who have indicated to them in witness interviews that people were going in and out of those rooms or moving some of those boxes. It's also noteworthy, Alex, that in the affidavit we saw today, they believe that they had probable cause to search not just the storage room, but also something known as the residential suite. I assume that's where Trump lives. Um, something called the Pine Room and something called the 45 office. And so it looks like from those words that those boxes were moved and scattered around other places in the residence. And so even if they had a padlock on the storage room, there's certainly grave concern about them being stored in other places in the residence. And so it seems like there must have been witnesses providing information so that they could knew to look on this surveillance video. And perhaps it was the surveillance video that revealed some of the things that appeared in that search warrant affidavit. What about the letter signed by Trump's attorney, uh, Christina Bob, drafted by his other attorney, Evan Corcoran, saying effectively <laughs> nothing to see here, folks. Uh, this was a letter sent to the DOJ in June. How concerning is that when you're looking at an obstruction charge? Well, um, rule number one for aspiring lawyers, if uh, Mr. Corcoran writes the, um, the draft, maybe Mr. Corcoran should be the one who <laughs> signs it and not uh, another lawyer, Christina Bob. Um, if those lawyers believed that that was true because Donald Trump or someone else told them it was true, then uh, perhaps they don't have any liability. If they knew that they were continuing to retain documents and representing in writing that all documents had been returned, they have a very serious problem of obstruction of justice, as we just discussed. That is a 20-year felony. Now, it could be that they were unwitting agents, that someone told them to make that representation. If that someone is Donald Trump, then he is also liable, or it could be liable for using them as unwitting agents to make his own statement. If he knew that that statement was going to be passed on to the Justice Department, then he could be guilty of that offense. The last thing I'll just bring up as we talk about his Cracker Jack defense team is the fact that today was the deadline, I believe. Uh, the, law, the legal team yeah. representing Donald Trump, today was the last day they had to file their papers um, requesting a special master, a sort of independent third-party review of the materials seized um, in early August by the DOJ. And according to the Trump-appointed judge, they did it wrong. They did not file that request correctly. Um, are, do you have confidence in, in Donald Trump's legal representation at this juncture? Well, the document they, si they filed on Monday was uh, so amateurish. Uh, it was in the wrong court. It didn't file a, a, a ledge of cause of action. Um, it, uh, they failed to provide service. They didn't explain why it was uh, unrelated to another case. Uh, and so, no, uh, that is some very shoddy lawyering. But it seems that he's having a difficult time finding someone to represent him uh, who may be able to handle this in a, a more professional manner. The understatement of the year. Barbara McQuaid, former U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan. Thank you for your time and expertise this evening. Thanks, Alex.